Good afternoon, Sheriff Hamilton. We good afternoon. are very delighted to have you with us this afternoon to tell a little bit about um, your career and also uh, as part of the story of Pflugerville. Pflugerville is a part of Travis County. And so tell us your name and where you were born. Um, my name is Greg Maurice Hamilton, or Gregory Maurice Hamilton. Uh, a lot of people here in this area uh, from my dare days know me as Hambone. Uh, that was my nickname, and a lot of the students called me that. I'm from Colleen, Texas. And where were you born? Colleen, Texas. Colleen, Colleen okay. Texas. And so did you go to high school? In I did. I graduated from Colleen High School. Okay. So what activities were you in in high school? I played uh, all sports. I was football, basketball, baseball, ran track. Uh, I was part of the Key Club. I was part of uh, the uh, student council. Um, uh, anything that I, can, I could get involved with. Uh, my mom insisted that I stayed active, so that was one of the things. If there was something going on that was positive, my mom was pushing me there, whether it was at school or whether it was in the church. So uh, what position did you play on football? I, I know you look at me, but I tell you, uh, uh, I played quarterback. And I was quarterback at Southwest Texas State with Coach Jim Wacker, uh, and we won the championship. And I started all four years. Uh, at quarterback. Matter of fact, Bobcats. Southwest Texas, yes, then it was Southwest Texas Bobcats. There was, uh, the first time I heard about Pflugerville was there's a young man that played on my team over there. His name was Lofton Levels. Lofton Levels played with me at, and he kept talking about Pflugerville. And uh, I said, man, where is that? And we, we had to come through Pflugerville or pass by Pflugerville coming from Colleen to get to San Marcos, but I had never heard of Pflugerville, and, and uh, he was the first one to bring Pflugerville to my attention back in the days when I was at Southwest Texas. And Lofton was one of my wonderful students. Really? Once upon a time. And his sister, Daphne, <coughs> and younger brother, um, Kevin. Uh, so what did you do in uh, baseball? What position? Played pitcher and uh, uh, catcher and third and first base. Multi-talented and could multitask. I don't know about multi-talented. I could multitask, uh, but but I did get a four-year scholarship to Southwest Texas State. Otherwise, I wouldn't have had an opportunity, or I would have struggled in uh, in order to financially, uh, financially uh, go to college. So, uh, where did your career take you then? Uh, what, what did you did you uh, get a degree, or how did you get into law enforcement? Well, uh, uh, like most uh, uh, aspiring athletes. You never really think uh, that, that the subject matter that you study in school that you're going to ever have to use that because you're going to play football all your life. And I was one of those individuals that I thought that I was going to go and play professional football and uh, make a lot of money and then whatever I do with, with, the, with, with uh, the rest of my time, I was going to open up businesses. And, 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 uh, uh, but at the time, the majority of my friends were uh, majoring in criminal justice, so I decided to major in criminal justice, and I did get my college degree. Um, I was fortunate. I uh, had a lot of individuals that played football with me uh, that played their four years of football and didn't finish college, and now uh, some of them are doing really well, but other ones are in the penitentiary because of bad decisions. And, and um, when you play sports and, and you're one of the, 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 the big boys on campus, when all of that goes away, it seems to uh, disrupt your thinking. And I was fortunate enough because I believe because of my base, my foundation, um, uh, I, I must say that there was a period of time that I floundered out there, but then I got right back on track. Um, so criminal justice was the, what everybody was getting in, either that or PE or coaching. And I decided to, because I was always fascinated with with uh, 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 cops and robbers and uh, when I was growing up and I wanted to be the one to wear the white hat and so I did I did get my my college degree and uh, after I graduated I went to Canada tried to play football there got my knees banged up uh, but I was blessed to be able to have a college degree and I came back to Colleen Texas and started working uh, at uh, I uh, applied for a job at the state prison, and I worked at Coalfield in Palestine, Texas, uh, for a short period of time, 
and um, I felt like I was in prison more than the individuals that were sentenced there. And I, I thought to myself, I didn't go to college to, to be a prison guard. I wanted to do something different. Um, and at that time, I moved up here to Austin, and I started working at the Austin State Hospital and uh, worked there for about a year and a half. And at that time, I had friends that were working at Travis County Sheriff's Office, and I applied, and I got the job there. Was the, the uh that out on Weberville Road at the time, or was it still in downtown Austin? What's that, Travis? The, the Austin State School. Austin State there? Hospital. Austin, Austin State, State Hospital is on Guadalupe, and it's still there. Oh, okay. It's right it's there, there. Yeah, north of campus. There. Yes, that's correct. Okay. okay. Right. Okay. So then, uh, so how did you come about to uh, run for sure? Well, um, uh, let's 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 go back a little further. I was uh, I was uh, working at the sheriff's office. Started working in the jail. From the jail, I went to, uh, I, I applied to be a patrol officer. I worked in the jail probably about a year and a half, and I applied to be a, a patrol officer. So I went on the streets, uh, uh, I went through the academy, finalized the academy, and then I became a patrol officer. And then there was a program called DARE that we were about to start uh, here in Travis County. And uh, I was new. Uh, as far as being on patrol, and um, Dwayne Bailey, who is my mentor, who's the former sheriff here, uh, said that he wanted to start the D.A.R.E. program, and it's a, a drug abuse resistance education. And it just so happened that uh, here in Travis County, I was one of the first three to kick off that program to get it going here. And Pflugerville just so happened to be uh, Northwest Elementary, Palmer Lane Elementary, um, there were several other schools that I did and I just come to love the school district and that was one of the reasons that I I moved to, to uh, Pflugerville because I wanted my kids in this school district as opposed to uh, Austin school district and it was uh, it was it was much more quaint than 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 Austin and I thought that this was an extremely safe community and that's where uh, uh, why I decided to move here to raise my family and I and I have never regretted it uh, my kids have turned out to be some good citizens, and I, I think it's because of part of their education and the people that lived around us because we, it, it's, it's truly uh, uh, not just a, a, a cliche that it takes a village to raise a kid, and, and uh, uh, we've seen that here. And it reminded me of, of my hometown in Colleen. If you were down the road acting up, a neighbor would come out and take care of you and then call your mom and your mom would take care of you. And uh, where I lived in Colleen, um, off of June Street, we had probably about eight or nine of my uncles and aunts that lived on that, on that street. So not only did the neighbor come and take care of you, they tell your mom, your mom take care of you, and then your aunts and uncles come over and take care of you. So it, it was that same type of atmosphere. Uh, here, so that's how I got here to to Pflugerville, and um, I stayed in the Dare program uh, in this particular area uh, for uh, I stayed in the Dare program for five years, and uh, uh, because of my relationships that I had built in the community, and uh, the Dare program just exploded. Travis County's Dare program was well known not only around the state but around the country. And I had an opportunity to be a part of a lot of organizations, and um, uh, just so happened that Ann Richards had heard uh, about me through Doyne Bailey, and Doyne Bailey was left. Doyne Bailey left Travis County Sheriff's Office. Uh, he retired from the Sheriff's Office and went to the uh, Texas Alcoholic Beverage Commission, and I was just a officer. And Doyne Bailey wanted me. Uh, he got approval t from Ann Richards to bring me over to TABC as the chief over the state of Texas, of the Texas Alcoholic Beverage Commission. And uh, from there, um, I became president of a lot of national and international organizations. And um, at, uh, after 10 years at, at uh, TABC, uh, there was a headhunter that came uh, from um, D.C. that wanted me to be the chief of the of the Alcoholic Beverage Commission in Washington, D.C. I decided that I was going to take that job, and, and, and I think about a month before I was about to sign the papers to take the job, uh, I decided that it was time for me to tell my daughter 
that uh, I'm going to move to D.C. for a year. She just so happened to be in the 10th grade at the time. I was going to allow her to finish her, well, no, she was in the 11th grade at the time. I was going to let her finish her 11th grade year uh, here at Pflugerville, then I was going to move the family to D.C. with me, but I wanted to make sure that this was the job for me. And my daughter looked at me and said, Dad, we'll have fun in D.C. because I'm graduating from Pflugerville. And I thought that was inconsiderate of me not to have brought her into the conversation. So at that time, I decided that I wasn't going to go to D.C. And it just so happened that the Sheriff Frazier, who was the sitting sheriff, uh, uh, had decided that she wasn't going to run again. And there was a group of people that came to me and asked me to consider running. And it took some convincing uh, because I know that politics is a, is a full contact sport uh, here in Travis County. And I really didn't, I didn't know much about politics. I knew that I voted, that's the only thing. But as far as getting out, kissing babies and shaking a lot of hands, I did that uh, because that was me, but not going out asking people to vote for me or give me money for my campaign. So uh, I said, I'm not going to do it. And then I met uh, Margot Frazier. It was the, the Saturday after Thanksgiving back in uh, 2003, 2004. And uh, when I left her house, I was running for sure. And I can tell you that uh, it, it has been probably the best and most, um, um, not rewarding, I don't know what the word is for, but it's, it is fulfilling, fulfilling yes, a uh, job that I've, I've ever had. And it's not because of the fact of being sheriff, it's the fact that you're able to shape and mold law enforcement and change it to a community policing type organization. And I think that over the last 11 years, that, that uh, Travis County is not the same when, it, when, when I came there. Not that it was bad, Travis County Sheriff's Office, not that it was bad, but I think that, that we are more engaging, we're more community-minded, um, we, uh, officers are truly, uh, th that are coming into the mix on the most part, are truly servant leaders, and they are wanting to give back to the community. I know when I first came to, uh, to the Sheriff's Office and I talked about my philosophy, People were looking at me like I was crazy. Uh, they was, I heard some people, they never said it to my face, but uh, I heard from other folks that, that I don't want people to go out and do law enforcement. But to me, giving back to the community is good law enforcement. Going to the schools and reading with the kids, getting down on your knees, reading uh, to them, or sitting in one of these chairs where you're hanging off the side of it is, is good police work. Uh, we, one of the first things that I did that I am so proud of is that there was a, uh, we decided to get involved with Habitat for Humanity. And we uh, went out and we were building this house. I got, uh, I had probably about 200 officers out there the first day that was out there with their hammers and their saws, uh, building, helping build this home. And uh, there was a guy, and I did several exposés because I guess it was first time that a law enforcement agency that had this many people are uh, volunteered to be the sole uh, uh, builder uh, in this project. Uh, so I had a builder that came by that uh, he's, he came by and he, uh, it was probably after my third interview that day uh, from a different radio, I mean, t uh, TV station. And he said, uh, Sheriff Hamilton, uh, I really appreciate what you're doing and I want my company to, I want, I want my company to help you build a house. He said that I would like for you to identify some needy person, uh, an elderly person that need their house uh, either fixed up or rebuilt. And uh, I, I wasn't born just yesterday. Y'all know that somebody will come and make these promises and then weeks pass and you don't get anything done. So I asked the builder, let's, uh, because I was in a neighborhood in East Austin where a lot of the houses were dilapidated and they were elderly people that had lived there for a long period of time. I, so I told him, let's get in my car, let's go find one now. And uh, he looked at me like I was crazy, I said, come on. So I started walking to my car, he got in uh, the other side and I was riding around and I looked up as I seen this lady in the, in the looked like she was in a ditch and, and she was doing something. Uh, so I said, let's stop over here. And we stopped over there. 
uh, and she was in the back, she was trying to unclog her septic tank uh, with, a, with a stick. And um, I introduced myself to the young lady, and um, um, we call her Mama Houston was, was her name, and we call her Granny also. Um, we selected that house, and I told her, I said that my name is Greg Hamilton, I'm Travis County Sheriff. She's looked at me like I was crazy, and I said that this is such and such, and he's a home builder, and uh, he has volunteered to redo your house. And um, she looked at me, yeah, people have come over and said that before and haven't done it. Well, I said, well, Granny, uh, Greg Hamilton has never told you that, and we're going to do that. So what we did was we went out and did a plea to the churches. We went, uh, had a plea to uh, businesses, and we've got everything donated to build a new house. We knocked her house down. Matter of fact, Matthew McConaughey's brother has an excavation company, and he came out himself personally, not Matthew McConaughey, but his brother, who lives here in, in Austin, came out. Uh, Bama Brown from the radio station, uh, he was a, a part-time, um, he, he was a, a co-owner of a, a home building company, and we all worked together. Uh, we got Lowe's involved, we got my deputies involved, we got cement companies involved, and from the cement to every appliance in the house, it was donated. We even had people that came out and built uh, Granny a walking track in the back and put a greenhouse. Uh, and one of the things that, uh, after we did our ceremony uh, with, with Granny, I always wanted to say, move that bus. So we brought out our big, our big uh, b uh, inmate passenger bus and it had it parked in the way. And um, I had Granny staying with her, her niece and nephew uh, for uh, we thought that uh, we were going to be able to do this in three months. It took us a year to build a house, but the niece and niece and nephew allowed her to stay over at the house during the time that we we were doing that and watching uh, uh, whatever they call it the home makeover. It only take them a week to do it. I thought we could pull that off, but with all the permits and and not having the money to actually go out and buy the material we were able to uh, talk to people. Uh, churches came through, got all of the linings and furniture companies put the furniture in there. Granny had never had central air and central heat. And uh, on the day that we gave her the keys, I guess it had hit national news. And I had a guy from Dallas that called me and said that they were going to pay for Granny's electricity for the year, the first year. And uh, so I went back and told her, and I would visit her on a regular base, basis, and it was summertime. She would never turn the air conditioner on. She wasn't used to it, didn't know anything about it. Uh, but uh, Granny passed away three years after we had given her the house of cancer. But uh, I can tell you that I believe that those last three years was probably some of her better years. And that, that is probably one of the things that I will never forget is being able to do that. So uh, your department uh, has done so many programs of that same nature to help. Uh, let's talk just uh, maybe about two or three others. I know you've done the uh, Handbag. Handbag for Hope. Yes. Hand Handbags for Hope is a, a program with the Texas Advocacy Project. Uh, this is a, a organization that, that uh, focuses on domestic violence uh, victims and uh, they give them the legal advice, they give them an escape plan, they talk to them counseling, and uh, one of the things that, that they started a project a couple of years ago that wasn't getting a lot of traction uh, called Handbags for Hope. Uh, and the Handbags for uh, Texas Advocacy Project, uh, the base office is, I mean the headquarters is here in Austin, Texas. They got small satellite uh, throughout the state but they wasn't getting very much traction on this handbag for hope uh, and the handbags are for the kids that uh, uh, the kids of a domestic violence victim uh, on Mother's Day uh, what 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 they do uh, is bring these purses either new or gently used the gently used purses we take those purses uh, like I believe uh, last year we probably had about 4,500 purses we take those purses out to my jail facility and the, the individuals that are, are in our jail, we uh, give them work to do. And they clean these purses up, the ones that are gently used, 
and make them look like they're brand new. And then the kids are able on Mother's Day or the day before Mother's Day to go and pick out a purse for their mother to give their mother a gift. And in that purse, located underneath the bottom of the the base of the purse, inside, uh, there's an escape plan for uh, the, the mother and there's a phone hotline number. So that card is always there if they are ever a victim again of a domestic violence uh, 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 incident, they are able to look, know that that card is under there and it gives them all kinds of instructions on how to get out of that. Uh, I want you to talk a little bit about the Deutschen Fest Parade. You were in that once upon a time. The, I believe that the Deutschen uh, uh, Fest Parade is one of the, uh, uh, the events that put me on the map to run for sure. Um, matter of fact, uh, uh, when, when I first started running, although I was pretty well known in, in the Pflugerville area because of my involvement in the D.A.R.E. program, um, a lot of those kids, matter of fact, I've got, uh, I've got four or five kids that were in my first uh, D.A.R.E. class at Northwest Elementary that are working at Travis County Sheriff's Office. It's just amazing. Um, uh, but Dorchin Fest Parade, I was able to uh, uh, get the word out that I was running uh, for office and uh, um, I got a lot of volunteers out of this particular area and over the years uh, at the Deutschen Fest Parade I've even come in on a horse, I've, I've ridden a horse, I've even had a ho horse drawn carriage also so uh, uh, and then I get to go over to Roger Beasley who's a big supporter of mine and uh, occasionally he lets me pick out one of his fancy cars. I've had opportunity to drive Maseratis and, and Porsche and, and, uh, and any kind of car, you, you just name it. But the Deutschen Fest Parade is, I believe, is one of the places that uh, I got my true base when I was running for, for office. So that, that parade, I'm in a lot of parades, but that parade is near and dear to me. Uh, in your work as, uh, in your department, your the vehicles that either you or your constables uh, drive, the technology, uh, et cetera, has changed uh, since you first started in law enforcement. Can you talk about uh, uh, some of the, the changes? Well, f first of all, the constables is a separate entity. Okay. Uh, Travis County, uh, uh, there are five constables in, that are elected officials, and they have their own little precinct. And then Travis County Sheriff's Office, I have 1,600, a little bit more than 1,600 employees. That's uh, the ones that work in the jail and also the individuals that are out on patrol. But as far as the, the technology, when, when I, when I uh, first uh, started uh, Travis County Sheriff's Office, we had a, uh, we had, the only thing we had was a radio and a flashlight in our pocket. We did have the big bubble lights up on top of the, of the, and in some of the cars, we had the Kojak light where you had to stick the, the, the light out on, on, on top. I wish I would have kept one as an antique or something. I'm pretty sure I could probably find it in the, in the old uh, scrap pile. But uh, now we have cameras in every car, which I think is a, is a great thing because uh, uh, a lot of officers, anytime you're going to put a camera on them, uh, initially their initial response is that you're trying to catch us doing something wrong. No, we're trying to protect you because people are coming in making complaints about this. Of making, I wish we would have had those cameras way back in the day. Um, um, the uh, ability to have computers in the car, you get, you get information instantly, and you don't have to do all the talking on the radio anymore. You just look over there at that, commu uh, at that computer. But I, I look at the, as the computer as a double-edged sword because officers, uh, I've noticed them riding down the road, driving, and over here looking at their computer. Uh, but we constantly try to train them that if you're going to use your computer, you pull over. And then you get the information that you need, and then you can proceed. Um, we have, uh, uh, back in the day, only certain individuals had radar in their car. Uh, now almost all of our cars have have uh, radars in 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 our vehicles, uh, and uh, not only what's on the cars but what's on our on our gun belt. Uh, some of us 
uh, if, if we don't watch out, are going to have real bad backs uh, as we get older because uh, there are so many tools out there. You've got the taser, you've got your weapon, you've got your nightstick, you've got uh, the radio, um, and then officers, some have two or three different um, uh, handcuffs on them, uh, that, that belt, and then you have pepper spray. Um, it's, it's, uh, I, I think the tools are, are good, but then I think the best tool that, that we have as law enforcement, which it doesn't matter if it was back in the day or if it was now, is your mouth, the ability to communicate uh, to an individual as opposed to all of these weapons. Although I will tell you that the world is, is, is much more dangerous, I think, than, than when I first started in, in law enforcement. And I think that those individuals, there are individuals out there who want to do harm to law enforcement just because they wear their badge and they don't have respect for authority. Uh, I think over, sadly, I think over the, the next several years, uh, you're going to see more and more of what happened in New York where the officers are just sitting in their car and uh, somebody drive by just because and, and, and do something bad to them. So, but, but as far as the, the, the technology is concerned, um, I think the technology is great, but I still say that the best tool that any of those officers have is the ability to communicate with the person that they're dealing with. So when someone joins your department, uh, do y'all have uh, in-house training to get them accustomed to what's going on in Travis County and uh, you yourself uh, or any of the officers? In a lot of professions, careers, you have to do continuing education. Uh, go to a class to learn what, what um, what's the latest. So what, what happens with, in law enforcement for uh, training or ongoing? Training? Well, Travis County Sheriff's Office, the first thing, uh, before you hit the streets, you have to go through our academy. And our academy is nine weeks. And uh, you go uh, from A to Z learning all, all of the the trends uh, in our particular area, you learn our policies, you learn the law, um, and you learn our practices. Uh, so the, the individuals are, are, are getting their training and also mandated by the state, there's 40 hours of training, which the topics change each year. Um, cultural diversity is there every year, uh, but, but there's, a, there's a certain amount of training that uh, it's 40 hours each year mandated by the state of Texas. And there's an organization called the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement, which is the education standard uh, uh, agency that uh, comes into an agency and audit to make sure that you're meeting all of the, all of the requirements. And if you don't, you get gig. And uh, one of the things that I can say about our academy is that over the last, the last nine years, I've been there 11, the last 10 years, I've been there 11, uh, our, our officers that go through our academy go and take that, that state licensing exam and each one of them uh, have passed 100% over the last 10 years the first time around. Oh, that's amazing. And, and I think it's due to the, 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 the training and the amount of training that these individuals get. Uh, there is a statewide statewide networking so that you are able to see best practices say in the metro areas or across the state y'all have a, a state law well there's a there's a, a, a there's many law enforcement associations out there and uh, we are part of a, of uh, of almost all of them and matter of fact uh, either we are on the board uh, my staff are either on the board or they are the president of the association and and during my 11 years as uh, Travis County uh, Sheriff, uh, I just finished the uh, being the president of the FBI Law Enforcement Executive Development Association, which it's executive level training. And uh, I've been on that board for six years. I'm past president as we speak. Uh, uh, while I was at TABC, I was the uh, president of the National Liquor Law Enforcement uh, Association, which was an international. So there's always conversation on what's what's going on, and I served on I, I serve presently on about 15 national and international boards. So the trends uh, not only do I bring back, but when our officers go to conferences, they are mandated to bring back the new trends and share it 
uh, with, with the offices and we uh, uh, receive many publications. The, the internet is full of all the information out there and we try to send our people to as much training as possible. But one of the, the, the big issues right now that Travis County Sheriff's Office is facing is that uh, I've got about 1,675 employees. Over the next two to three years, 70% of those individuals can retire. So we, are, we, we have a leadership vacuum. And I am sending um, all of my, my up and coming leaders and present supervisors to training all the time. I, I do not spare uh, our resources as, as our funding on, uh, on, on uh, sending people to training. I think that's some of the best, uh, that's the best spent money is spending them to help educate. Even if they're, you know, you have some people that have, I've got an officer that's been there 34 years at Travis County Sheriff's Office and I looked at his uh, employee development folder and he's a lieutenant and I looked at his employment development folder the other day and uh, he hadn't been to any training in the last four or five years because he knows everything but uh, over the next year if he's still going to be here he's mandated to pick up on on the leadership training everybody has to do that that state mandate uh, training well and the networking uh, sometimes things evolve from one area something might start in Houston or the valley and it'll spread real quickly well, to the, all other communities and so well, the big deal right now is, uh, and it's been there for a while, is the drug interdiction. Uh, and I-35 is, a, is, a, is one of the main veins that uh, drugs are moving from Mexico to all of the other parts of the, of, of the country. They're coming in 18 wheelers, they're coming in caskets, they're coming uh, in you name it. They, uh, these folks are, are slipping heroin and cocaine and marijuana and even shipping money back in the same manner um, and in the caskets, in the wheels of cars, uh, in the seats of cars, and, and they're pretty elaborate. Uh, and that money, um, I, would, I would venture to say that some of that money is going, going, well, a lot of money going back to the cartel, but I also think it's going to some terrorist groups too. So we, we, are, we are part of a lot of different task force, and it's very important uh, prior to um, September 11th, uh, the, the, the feds kept a silo. They, they would want you to give them all of your information, but they would never share. But I think 2000, um, uh, September 11th changed the mindset of the feds, and there's more conversation, uh, information sharing. And in order for us to keep this country safe, we're going to have to continue to share information, and uh, the, the, the feds cannot just keep that information close to their vest. And we're seeing more uh, interlocal, uh, more uh, collaboration between the different law enforcement agencies. I had the opportunity to <coughs> uh, visit the command center down off of 51st mm -hmm. Street. And that's, I don't know how long it's been there, but it's amazing. And uh, uh, I guess that's a place you really don't want to have to take a chair until it's necessary. Right. But, uh, Obviously, that uh, decision-making, collaboration, and and having the location is is, is vital at the state capitol, also. Yeah, and, and and it is, and and one of the things that get me, we you have a lot of these organizations out there that think that uh, that and and it's called ARIC, Austin Regional Information Center or Fusion Center, uh, but it's called the the command center also. <coughs> but you have organizations uh, all over the country that are very vocal and uh, unfortunately the, some of these, these media folks are, are only telling their story and these groups are saying that that, that type of um, uh, task force or that type of setup is nothing more than Big Brother looking at everybody's information. You know, everybody sees the black planes, the black helicopters and the black cars. Uh, that that uh, ARIC is good for this country because you're gathering all of that information, you're getting intel on people that possibly uh, want to harm you. And I prefer them to have these, these individuals, to have this type of, of, uh, of uh, unit to keep this community safe as opposed to 
not having it. It's kind of like when you f when they first started, uh, 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 when you had to go to the airport and get patted down maybe if they sus suspect something and you have people pitching a fit about that. I'd rather be safe uh, while I'm up in the air as opposed to, uh, but everybody is throwing out their constitutional rights and that's arguable, you know, on, on some of the way some of these people interpret the, the law. Uh, we, we just have a lot of hate group or anti-government people out there. Uh, you know, I've got my distaste for government in, in many ways, but I think the government is good for us. Um, when we look at Travis County, the land boundaries are exactly the same <coughs> on the edge, but what happens inside is you have, uh, with our extreme growth in this area, you know, some of the cities are expanding, so you have city limits, and then you have outside of the city limits, which is strictly your jurisdiction. Right. And while you might think the the land size has decreased because of the population, you're still serving more people than you ever have, you know, I'm thinking. That's correct. And, and um, even though in some areas we are landlocked as far as uh, where, where people can build and where people can move, uh, but uh, uh, as I go to many meetings uh, uh, with, with, uh, with the Travis County Commissioner's Corps or with the city of Austin, these uh, demographers are saying that uh, uh, within a couple of years that uh, that this whole area could uh, be a third you know, more uh, in a short period of time. And uh, the, the bad thing about it is that our traffic uh, uh, is, is getting worse and there's no real uh, viable mode of transportation besides your, your vehicle. And the more cars we have out there, we talk about the ozone, um, uh, uh, I remember the, the county commissioner, uh, I mean, not commissioner, Judge Bisco, uh, had put out a notice to a lot of the individual uh, uh, agencies that had a fleet that, that he wanted us to lower the, uh, the idling on the car because of the, I don't understand all of it, but uh, uh, the ozone layer was getting thinner and thinner. Uh, so. Uh, that's another problem if we have all these cars you're not going to decrease that so we've got to come up with with some other uh, means of, of transportation and uh, even looking at it on a on an emergency side there's there's period of time when there could be a major catastrophe that occurs and your your first responders aren't going to be able to get there because I-35 is is extremely full and I live right off the toll road now traffic is picking up over there and I know that one of the reasons they had built that tow road or people were hoping that uh, some of these big trucks would come off of 35. I see just as many big trucks on on 35 as it always have been and I see a bunch of big trucks on on uh, on uh, the tow road so I don't know what they're going to do. I, I tell you what I wouldn't want to be in Steve Adler's position right now especially with uh, 10 or 9 new city council uh, folks, it's going to be years before they come up with, uh, f first, be able to work together, and then secondly, come up with a plan. Well, and yesterday was a perfect example of <coughs> when we had the heavy rain and SH-130 had a wreck southbound and I-35, and so you have people that can't move. They're, they're kind of stuck for a while and they've been kind of prepared. So, uh, so. Uh, what do you see um, in the next, uh, you alluded a little bit to that, 5, 10, 15 years out uh, with your department or even in the area here, uh, well, other than more growth and crowded roads? Well, you, you hit the nail on the head. That's definitely going to be both of those uh, there. Um, I think that with growth, uh, that you have to be concerned about uh, safety concerns uh, because you have individuals moving here. Uh, most of them are moving here for opportunities. Um, but then again, there are a lot of people that are coming here. Here, oppor the, the first group that I talked about are opportunities as far as business as aspect or being able to, to have a better life uh, legally. Then you have that other element that comes in uh, Austin, uh, I consider Austin, Travis County, and uh, um, Austin, Pflugerville, Round Rock, pretty soon we're going to be so butted up against each other, you're not going to know the, 
the difference from one to the other. And I think that, that one of the, the important pieces is that we continue as law enforcement to continue to have that good relationship. But one of the things that I've, I've noticed uh, over the years that as departments grow, uh, that they tend to lose that, that hometown feeling. Um, and I, I, believe that it's a, I, I believe that it's very important that uh, law enforcement continue to reach out to be a part of the community. And um, um, I, sometimes I wonder if it should be mandated that you stay in the county in which you work as far as if you're law enforcement. That's one of the trends that people are looking at right now because if you work here and live in San Antonio, you don't have that, that same sense of hometown feeling. Uh, so if you live here, I am a, a true believer that people buy into what they help create. And um, I think it's important that we, we maintain as we grow, that we maintain that hometown that hometown relationship uh, with the people that we serve. I think it's also important that as, the, as our workforce in law enforcement uh, uh, get younger and younger, that uh, the leaders ensure that these individuals have the training and have the mentors that will train them about community policing, that, that train them that their mouth is the best tool. They can put all these things on their belt that they want to, but their best tool is the way that they work with others. And we need to have individuals that believe that in order to build a relationship, that you're gonna have to build trust first. And if you can't build a relationship if you don't have trust, uh, not one before, I mean, not relationship before uh, trust. So it's important that we focus on that also. Um, the other thing is gonna be traffic and, and, and growth is gonna be the big change here and how we deal with that or how the leadership deals with that is gonna determine on what this city is gonna be like in the, in the uh, whether it's Austin, whether it's Pflugerville, Round Rock, Leander, because all of us are gonna be landlocked and we're just gonna be one just big, hopefully, a uh, happy community. Well, uh, I live in Travis County, out of sight of Pflugerville, and sometimes there's, you know, when you have that little fender bender, uh, people have to think, so who do we call? You just call 911 and then they figure out what officer from what area to send them. So whether you're in the city of Pflugerville, city of Round Rock or Travis County, somebody will show up. And we have that problem, uh, we've had that problem for years up in the Round, uh, Round Rock area around McNeil. Uh, that's always been, and it's even gotten worse now because Austin has come in and they have annexed part of that. At one point in time, it was Travis County and just uh, Travis County and Williamson County. Now is uh, Travis County, Williamson County, uh, Round Rock PD, Pflugerville. We might have all four get there and still can't determine. We had a guy that uh, probably about, it had to be about six, seven, eight months ago. Our guys, um, I've got a couple of guys on the FBI uh, bank robbery task force and they were looking at this guy for a while and they uh, had located where he, he lived. And um, he, he had robbed a couple of banks here and other places. And this particular guy, they spotted him uh, right off of um, Howard Lane. And they followed him to his, to his house and there was a shootout and he was killed. Um, and when they called the first, although FBI was there, uh, there was a guy from Round Rock PD that's on the task force. There was my Travis County and there was APD people that's part of the task force. So they called, APD gets to the scene and it's not a very far off, it's not very far from 35 and the Shamrock that's on the corner, right across from Connolly High School. Right. It's the first street there. Right. So APD gets there and start working the scene come to find out that it's not their scene. So they call in Round Rock. Round Rock, it's not their scene. It's our scene. And we were the four, we did not get called over there for an hour and a half, two hours uh, after this uh, uh, incident occurred. So that, that has been going on uh, for a while. And I live in Star Ranch. And the house behind me is in Williamson County. 
I'm in Travis County. That's good. Huh? That has to oh, be. Oh, yeah, 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 it has to be. Uh, now, do you have a uh, spokesman for the Sheriff's Department that we see occasionally on the news? And uh, He's been there a good number of years. He's very charming. You want to tell us a little bit about him? Yeah, Roger Wade has been there. Uh, he, matter of fact, he and I were on patrol together. And um, when I left, I left in 94 uh, to go to TABC, uh, the uh, public information officer that was there before him had gotten sick and uh, somehow Sheriff Bailey asked Roger to come on board and, and, and take over and uh, he's been a, uh, uh, he's been the face of the Sheriff's Office for a long time. Sometimes, he never forgets his hat. I know, what, I, that's what I was about to tell you. Uh, I walked into his office, he's right down from mine, I walked into his office and he didn't have his hat on. And uh, I looked around, I said, have you seen Roger? And it's only small enough for him to be in there. I said, have you seen Roger? Have you seen Roger? Roger picked up his hat, put it on. Yeah, I'm right here. <laughs> yeah. and, and some people, uh, when he pulls off his hat, when we're at a banquet or something, some of the folks tell him, I didn't know you had hair. They didn't think he had hair because he always wore, he wears his hat all over, I mean, in the office all the time, most of the time. Well, you know, the Commissioner of Education, Mr. Williams, he always wears his signature bow tie. Yeah, I was at, uh, I was at uh, dinner with him about uh, six months ago. Yeah, I'm, and, and that's all I wear now is bow ties. I don't wear a straight tie anymore, and I tie my own bow ties. Um, you've had some hard times as a sheriff, uh, and I've heard you speak at um, ceremonies. You're a very humble, very touching, very inspiring person. Um, and I know some of your staff has stepped up to even provide music. And uh, I know those are tough times. You have to, uh, your job has a lot of parts is what I want to say. So I appreciate your service very much. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, go back just for a moment to the uh, Texas alcoholic beverage. So you probably knew Mr. Paul King. I did. And uh, his service there. Paul was one of our uh, board of trustees and uh, gave a lot of service to our community. And uh, I think he's retired now. He's he's retired, but somebody told me he's uh, doing some substitute teaching for you all. Oh, okay. He's he's here. And Kenny Thompson was uh, was uh, on the on the school board. Yes, yes. He was president actually. For right. A I was. Uh, that's another thing that got me into politics. I was uh, Kenny's first run. I was his campaign manager. Knew nothing about running a campaign. Okay. And, and I was his campaign manager. Well, and his son, Kenny, mm -hmm. uh, I think also has uh, been successful in his career. Uh, do you know? Yeah, Kenny, Kenny worked um, for, uh, he worked initially uh, when he started in politics, he worked for Cheryl Cole for the city of Austin. She was a city councilwoman. And uh, during the time that he was working for her, uh, Obama's uh, campaign kicked up. And somehow, I don't know if she referred uh, him uh, to their campaign, but he started working on his presidential campaign. And after Obama won, uh, Kenny went and worked for him as his uh, uh, front man to, to go out and uh, if, if he's gonna be in Africa, uh, Kenny would go there and set up, make sure that all the logistics were, were in place. But uh, he, he um, no longer works for Obama. I think he's been gone for probably about two, two and a half years. He's married and uh, he works for, I believe, PepsiCo, PepsiCo uh, in New York. Okay, are there any other stories you want to tell? that might be interesting, either with your career or related to Pflugerville. Any other characters in Pflugerville that you've met through business or leaders? Can't think of okay. Well, thank you so much thank for you. your service uh, to our community and to our county and beyond, as we found out today. Thank you. Thank you so much.